Another very lovely evening to all of you, my dear friends. I'm ever so thankful that you all could join me. We left off in our part 19 study on the life of Christ last time with Jesus. There's this multitude is surrounding him. They bring up to him a deaf and dumb man. He heals him. And that is where we pick up right here. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. Now do recall how Jesus has already fed the 5,000 plus uh, women and children. So right here we see another instance of him feeding a huge crowd. And his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. It is so perplexing how they immediately say, How can we feed so many? Whenever they've already seen him feed more than this. But Pulpit commented, such, is, such conduct is true to human nature, prone to forget past deliverance in the face of present difficulty. Immediately after the passage of the Red Sea, back in Moses' day, immediately after the passage of the Red Sea, the people feared that they would perish of thirst in the wilderness. And when God promised to give them flesh to eat, even Moses doubted the possibility of the supply and asked whence it could be provided. You can look that up in Numbers 11. So this is a very good lesson to learn how whenever you're in doubt, you've joined all the rest of humanity. God's not going to help me in this. I know he helped me in that, but he's not going to help me in this. And I don't even know. And everybody uh, kind of has that shaky part of faith somewhere in their walk with Christ on this earth. So don't be discouraged. Just uh, come right back. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them the same manner in which he did the last ones and he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude just as we went over last time my belief just a theory on how he did this because we're not given any other details other than he gave thanks and break them and then he gave them out and he fed thousands with these seven loaves and fishes the only way that i can think is that he took and he break and he just kept breaking that's the only way that i can really observe it and the reason that i believe that was possibly the method that was used here is because remember the water into wine he didn't just create the wine out of nothing he ordered them to fill up the water pots first so he used the water and then transformed it and they did all eat and were filled and they took up the broken meat that was left seven baskets full last time it was 12 baskets uh seven baskets full and they that did eat were four thousand men beside women and children charles ellicott brings back to remembrance this seven baskets that they have here later on in just a minute they'd say well we have no bread and it's very shortly after this it's like how did you run out of bread so quickly well the fact that the disciples were shortly afterwards again without provision or bread suggests the thought that the fragments themselves had been in their turn distributed to the poor of the villages in the district to which our Lord and the disciples now turned their courses, which they may have also done with the twelve baskets. They may have just distributed them out to the poor along their journey. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting him once again, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Matthew Henry commented, The Pharisees and Sadducees were opposed to each other in principles and in conduct, yet they joined against Christ. They desired a sign of their own choosing. They despised those signs which relieved the necessity of the sick and sorrowful and called for something else which would gratify the curiosity of the proud. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather. For the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today. For the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. 
He says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And remember what Paul the Apostle states about the Jews. He says, the Jews seek signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. And Jesus is likening any in whom are seeking after signs as wicked and adulterous, meaning idolatrous. But let's not leave out what he says, but the sign of the prophet Jonah will be given unto you. Now just call to memory what happened to Jonah and the whale, how he was cast overboard and the whale came up, ate him. He was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights and he came back and puked him up on the shore. Well, right here, Jesus says that would be a sign unto them because what happened to Jonah is just pointing to what's going to happen to Christ at his death, burial, and resurrection, how he would die and then go into the grave for three days and then rise again. Well, right here's some very fascinating uh, similarities that I found on this. Jonah was thrown into the sea by the mariners to whom he had entrusted himself. Christ was delivered to death by the Jews to whom he was specially promised. Jonah was willingly thrown into the sea. Christ laid down his life and man took it not from him. Jonah, by being cast into the sea, saved those in the ship. Christ, by his death, saved the children of men. Jonah, after he had been in the whale's belly three days, was cast up on dry land. Christ, after three days, rose again from the dead. The Ninevites, though upon the preaching of Jonah, they made a show of repentance, yet returning to their former sins, were soon after destroyed. So were the Jews within 40 years after Christ's ascension. Remember, Titus goes into Jerusalem and Israel and just wipes it out, even the uh, temple. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. You see, they're murmuring about bread, and that's the perfect opportunity for Christ to bring up the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod and even of the Sadducees. Barnes notes, the Pharisees sought his life and were exceedingly corrupt in their doctrine and, pr and practice. The Sadducees denied some of the essential doctrines of religion, like the resurrection and uh, the an afterlife and spirits. They didn't. The Sadducees uh, didn't believe any of that. And the Herodians probably were distinguished for irreligion, no religion, sensuality, and corrupt living. And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread that he says this. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not? And do ye not remember, when I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand... How many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said seven. That's a really good verse for anyone in whom says that the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 were the same events. Because I came across some people disputing over that. That verse clearly tells us those verses. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread about this leaven of the Pharisees and Herodians? that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, what they taught. He says, don't follow their teachings nor their examples. We as Christians may think it strange that these twelve did not understand things which are quite plain to us Christians. We see this and it's like, well, you got to be an idiot not to get that. But this may be a showing of the great emptiness in Israel at that time regarding spiritual matters. This, Whenever we're reading this, we have to look deeper than what they're just saying. Have they not been taught these things? And no, they have not. Jesus comes along and he's telling them spiritual things and they have no clue what he's talking about. And they cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man to him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. Once again, just as he did the deaf man in our, at the end of our last study, he takes them away from the multitude. He's way, Unlike how all of these flashy, fake healers of today... I'm turning it into pineapple juice. I'm turning it into pineapple. 
There's a lot of fumes, uh -huh. but I don't have any side effect. Amen. Amen. Oh. You want to drink pineapple juice? <laughs> okay. It's finished. Jesus. Mama, may do about your word with Jesus. Jesus. And I'm thinking, God, why is not the power of God moving? He said, because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. And there's this older lady worshiping right in front of the platform. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face. With your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. Bam! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. how they do everything in theatrics and they want to be seen by everybody. Jesus, as we see in these instances, he would take them away from the crowds and do this just very privately. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. Now, many may find it strange that Jesus spits actually like use a spit in this instance on his eyes the eyes were probably closed barnes said they were perhaps gummed or matted or united together by a secretion that had become hard over all this time to apply spit to them to wet them would be a sign a natural expression of removing the obstruction and opening them so jesus asked the man do you see anything and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. It's still blurry to him. But this also tells us something else about this man. He had not been born blind, Cambridge noted. Obviously, he knew what trees looked like. He remembered the appearance of natural objects, and in the haze of his brightening vision, he saw certain moving forms about him. After that, Jesus put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent away, sent him away to his house saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. I love this on Christ, how he says to so many of them. Matter of fact, probably half or if not most of the people that he heals, he tells them, don't tell anyone. And he doesn't want publicity for it because his time has not come yet. And he's not seeking attention at this time. This, this is a very humble, humble act and very illustrative that Christ really, truly does care about these people. And I'd say that we don't know thousands of other miracles that he actually performed just out of the kindness of his heart. Perhaps the one operation perfectly restored his eyes. Now, uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown tries to go through the process of this. Why didn't this man see clearly right off the bat? Perhaps the first operation perfectly restored his eyes, while the other imparted immediately the faculty of using them. It is the only recorded example of a progressive cure, and it certainly illustrates similar methods in the spiritual kingdom. Of the four recorded cases of sight restored, all the patients save one either came or were brought to the physician. In the case of the man born blind, the physician came to the patient. So some seek Christ and find Christ. Of others, he is found who seek him not. Which is very uh, telling. It's just, it preaches well. I know that how this one born blind Jesus went and sought him out. It's almost like those in whom have just lived in darkness <laughs> and have never even heard the gospel. Christ goes and seeks them out. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, which is north of Bethsaida, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? 
And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In this noble confession, Peter expressed the full belief of himself and of his brethren that he was the long-expected Messiah, that Jesus truly was the long-expected Messiah. Other people had very different opinions of him, but they were satisfied and were not ashamed to confess it. The disciples were satisfied and were not ashamed to confess it. Very important. For Jesus himself says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Romans 10, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Johann Bengel said, It is clear that Simon acknowledged the Son of God more quickly and fully and outshone his fellow disciples. He says firmly, Thou art, not I say that thou art. It behooved that Peter should first believe this and then hear it on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now that is very important. Just let that sink in before we go any further. He says firmly, thou art, as a fact. Not, I say that thou art, meaning, well, I'm th I think that you are. He says, thou art. Once again, Jameson Fawcett Brown, filling the light of his master's glory shining in his soul, he breaks forth, not in a tame, prosaic acknowledgement, I believe that thou art, but in the language of adoration, such as one uses in worship, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He first owns him, the promised Messiah, then he rises higher, echoing the voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now right here we learn Simon Peter's name, Bar-Jonah, and he says, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, meaning no Pharisee, no preacher, no scribe, nobody taught this unto you. No prophets, he says, my Father which is in heaven. Isaiah prophesied of him, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's not going to be an appealing guy. He's going to look like a, just a regular poor fellow walking around. In regard to the personal appearance of the Redeemer, what Jesus looked like, it is remarkable that the New Testament has given us no information. Not a hint is dropped in reference to his height or stra of, of stature or his form, respecting the color of his hair, his eyes, or his complexion. And all this, on which biographers are usually so full and particular, the evangelists are wholly silent. Now listen, there's probably a reason behind it. There was evidently design in this. And the purpose was probably to prevent any painting, statuary, or figure of the Redeemer that would have any claim to being regarded as correct or true. We are to believe on faith. And I say also unto thee, it's talking to Simon Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's a lot of of controversy about this verse ever since the Catholics took it and now all the popes claim that they're successors of Peter and all of that but we're not going to get into any of that I'm just going to quote you what Barnes said in respect of this he said he's basically saying thou <clears throat> thou art a rock a rock thou hast shown thyself firm and suitable for the work of laying the foundation of the church Upon thee will I build it. Thou shalt be highly honored. Thou shalt be first in making known the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles, as, as Peter does. It's not Paul the Apostle who first goes to the Gentiles. It's Simon Peter. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man, 
that he was Jesus the Christ. His time hadn't come yet to be revealed. The after history of Peter's work went through him. God opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles in Acts 14, Acts 15, was the proof of his faithful discharge of the office thus assigned to him. From that time, though, around then, around that time, because Jesus is teaching more and more open doctrines about this bread of heaven and everything, from that time, many of his disciples, this crowd that followed him, went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? This was the time to try them. And it is always a time to try real Christians when many professed disciples become cold and turn back. I'm certain that most of you have already seen this happen in your walk. How so many that were on fire for the Lord, now they're suddenly just cold and they just have fallen away. And then we may suppose Jesus addressing us and saying, will ye also go away? Observe here, it was submitted to their choice. God compels none to remain with him against their will. And the question in such trying times is submitted to every man, whether he will or will not go away. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Now notice how Simon Peter is grouping all of them together in this. He says, we all believe that you're the Son of God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Meyer noted, An outburst of grief at the sad catastrophe which he foresaw about Judas Iscariot, in the face of that joyous confession which the fiery Peter thought himself warranted in giving in the name of them all. Peter said, no, we'll, all of us, we're all for you. Jesus says, no, you're not. And Jesus, in speaking of Judas Iscariot's future, he gives one of the most frightening uh, tellings of what's going to happen to Judas or what is happening about how horrible that his future truly is and is right now even and has been for 2,000 years. He says, better for that man to have never been born. Better for, I mean, just, it's just so startling to think of. But that is it for today's study, my dear friends. I'm ever so thankful once again that you all could join me. Lord willing, we're going to be getting into part 21 tomorrow and the amount of transfiguration. I, it's a huge study. But uh, thank you all once again. God, a peace be with you. Amen.